This week, cold fusion updates, NSA backdoors, Ashley Madison's back in the news, don't use this CRM, more Android malware, and hacking TVs. All that and more on this edition of Hack Naked News. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show that brings you the security news each week. And despite popular belief, we do wear pants. It's Hack Naked News. Brought to you by... IT Pro TV, an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. Stream over 2,000 hours of up to date, high quality video content live and on demand. For a free seven day trial and for a limited time, get 50% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. Visit itpro.tv forward slash hack naked and use the code HN50. Do you have a website, an external presence, employees, an office? Any of these things can be compromised and attacked. How are you defending these assets? Have you penetration tested these public assets? Start 2017 by taking a proactive approach to securing your vulnerable areas. Black Hills Information Security has been helping companies find their weaknesses since 2008. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com and see how they can help you sleep better at night. Welcome to this episode of Hack Naked News. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, reporting on the security news for Thursday, April 27th, 2017. Before we get into the news, quick announcement. IT Pro TV's courses now include ITIL Managing the Lifecycle and Microsoft Hello for Business. You'd pay $85.70 a month or $857 per year, but we have a special offer for our listeners. For a limited time, get 50% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription by visiting itpro.tv forward slash hack naked and using the code HN50. Adobe has released patches for not Flash recently. I'm sure that's coming up next week probably, though. But this time for Cold Fusion, uh, customers are encouraged to upgrade Cold Fusion from Update 3 and earlier versions of Cold Fusion's 2016 release, Update 11 and earlier versions of Cold Fusion 11, and Update 22 of Cold Fusion 10. This fixes, uh, the fixes include remediation for Apache Blaze DS Java deserialization bug covered by CVE 2017-2066. This bug uh, also had to be updated by VMware and Atlassian as they include this product, uh, this, um, uh, whatchamacallit, they include cold fusion in their product lines. Deserialization bugs are nothing new, but an often forgotten about class of bugs. OWASP has some great materials on the subject if you'd like to do some further nerdy reading. Uh, NSA backdoor has been detected on 55,000 plus Windows boxes, but can now be safely removed. And the reports are all over the place. Microsoft says 10,000, some say 30,000. This article headline says 55,000, so we'll never probably know for sure. But on Tuesday, security firm Countercept released an update to the double pulsar detection script it published last week. It now allows people anywhere on the internet to remotely uninstall the implant from any infected machine. Of course, as I said, estimates on just how many machines infected uh, by the NSA backdoor are controversial, um, with all of those numbers being all over the place. Script kitties are poning thousands of window boxes uh, using NSA tools. Uh, the double pulsar is a backdoor, of course, used to inject malicious code on infected systems um, and is installed using the eternal blue exploit that attacks SMB file sharing services on XP to server 2008 R2. That means uh, to compromise a computer, it must be running a vulnerable version of Windows and expose an SMB service to the attacker. The fix for this particular vulnerability that's being exploited has been available since 2010. And Dan Tentler from the Phobos Group had the most colorful commentary on the subject and is quoted as saying, the polite term for what's happening is a bloodbath. The impolite version is a dumpster fire clown, a dumpster fire clown shoes shit show, Tentler said. Uh, he says, I'm hopeful that this is a wake up moment for people uh, over patching Windows machines. 
Very interesting, uh, colorful commentary from Dan. Thank you for that. Ashley Madison uh, is back in the news. A group threatening to leak the personal information of those found with Ashley Madison accounts is set to release details next month. Or you can pay them 500 bucks in Bitcoin uh, to have your name excluded. Thing is, though, the data is already available for those who know where to look, like the dark web. Uh, so the best bet is not to pay. And even better, not to probably cheat or do other immoral stuff like that. Tales of the Sugar CRM Security Horrors. This is uh, those considering Sugar CRM implementation should read this article from Ed Egidio Ed Ed Romano. Uh, I'm sorry for butchering the pronunciation of your name, but he wrote an article, Tales of Sugar CRM Security Horrors, where he states in the conclusion. I can say that Sugar CRM is one of the most insecure web applications I've ever seen in my life. And believe me, I've tested and reviewed a lot of web applications. I've been quite lucky in choosing CRM as a target for my experimental thesis. It made me reach some successful results by discovering lots of security issues in it. However, I think there are still room for improvements with regards to Sugar CRM security. I'm pretty sure there are still dozens of zero-day vulnerabilities probably affecting commercial versions as well. So I would say Sugar CRM could be the right choice for capture the flag competitions. It is not a resounding endorsement for your software when security professionals are recommending that it be used in capture the flag competitions. Just throwing that out there. False Guide Malware dupes 600,000 Android users. Of course, more warnings. Um, as an estimated 600,000 users have mistakenly downloaded malware from Google Play, uh, which, of course, is the official app store for Android devices. The malware attempts to build a botnet which delivers fraudulent mobile adware and earns money for the cyber, cyber criminals who created it, a business model that has been in, pl in play for quite some time. Good thing Google's on the case, though. Google spokesperson told uh, the reporting ZDNet uh, outfit that they are, and I quote, we're still making improvements to our system. Well, clearly. And also said um, the company is trying to make, uh, take immediate action whenever a questionable app, a questionable app is brought into their attention. Uh, yeah, by then, it's kind of too late. So, all righty then. Um, at least it was slightly better than Samsung's response, uh, who in response to a vulnerability pointed out in their TVs in Wi-Fi, Samsung has stated they have no plans to fix the following vulnerability. A security researcher is complaining that Samsung isn't making a serious response to a vulnerability in a Samsung TVs. The bug discovered by Pentest, Pentest outfit Nesseso concerns the television's implementation of Wi-Fi direct authentication. An attacker only needs to sniff out the MAC address of a trusted device to connect to the TV. From there, they can potentially enjoy a jump-off point to an attacker's network. Uh, so, yeah, and people say that TVs can be used as uh, a jumping off point. I have not seen that, having just presented on some uh, TV vulnerabilities. I think they're more serious uh, ones out there, and I have not yet seen it reported that they have, in fact, been used as a jumping off point. I think the jumping off point argument is largely used by security researchers to try and point out the severity of a flaw. Uh, in most cases, I find it to be largely unfounded in my research of IoT device security. In any case, up next, we have uh, Jason Wood from Paladin Security uh, with our expert commentary on smart city tech. Uh, no, it is not smart city tech. It is actually intercepting uh, radio communications from key fobs on cars. But first, a word from our sponsors. Has your network been breached? Cyber Reason can help you answer this question. Cyber Reason products hunt for threats within your network and eliminate them in real time. To Cyber Reason, real time means within seconds. Founded by former military hackers who don't play by the rules, they've built this experience into their platform. Harness ingenuity and imagination, not just code, to defeat attackers. Cyber Reason, disrupt the adversary and let the hunt begin. Gain control of cyber risk with Tenable IO, the first vulnerability management platform built for today's elastic assets like cloud, containers, and web apps. Discover a fresh asset-based approach that prioritizes vulnerabilities while seamlessly integrating into your environment. And improve ROI with the first elastic licensing approach based on assets, not IP addresses. Tenable IO delivers the data and context you need to secure your elastic attack surface. Start your free Tenable IO trial today by visiting tenable.io. 
Welcome back, everyone, to <clears throat> Hack Naked News. Uh, another quick announcement. Come check out Wild West Hackenfest. Wild West Hackenfest is put on by Red Team Specialists for anybody and everybody. Anybody and everybody, I guess. That's a lot of people interested in information security. Uh, join us on October 27th and 28th. Cause I'll be there, so I guess that's where the us comes from. Uh, for hands-on hardware hacking talks by famous infoseckers like Dave Kennedy, Deviant, Egypt, and, and there's just last names here, Nickerson, Gates, Mike Poor. He got his first name in there, which is awesome, and Sub T. Sounds like a lot of fun. Make sure you check out the website. Uh, like I said, I'll be there as well. John Strand, uh, who's hosting the event, wildwesthackinfest.com. That's wildwesthackin, H-A-C-K-I-N-fest.com. Jason Wood, welcome to this episode of Hack Naked News. I am excited to talk about this article uh, that I read yesterday, in fact, and for whatever reason, didn't put it in, in my notes. I think it's somewhat significant so i'm curious to hear your take on uh 11 radio gadgets that can help you steal a car hey paul yeah great to be here and thanks for having me back so uh i'm sure you all have seen uh, these cars out there where we don't have to use keys anymore you have the key fob in your pocket we, you walk up you touch the door handle it unlocks you sit down push the start button and away you go um some uh some gentlemen from the uh, Beijing-based security firm called Kuihu 360, and I'm sorry if I butchered that name, um, were speaking uh, two weeks ago at Hack in the Box in Amsterdam, where they demonstrated uh, some problems with this implementation. And one of the things that, uh, you know, I've heard of this happening before, but they made two major improvements in, in this process. Um, they, they built, first off, two devices for $11 each that allowed them to perform this relay attack. And the way it works is one guy is running with the original uh, or with one of the devices and he walks up to the victim while the, uh, the person who's about ready to boost the car is hanging out by the car. The, uh, the person near the victim gets, a, gets ready to, uh, to pass on some information. The guy at the car basically sends a response to the vehicle, a spoof response to the vehicle, and the car responds back with, okay, send me uh, this particular uh, request or code or whatnot to let me to let me know that this is authentic and I'll let you into the car. That device relays it in up to 1,000 feet to the guy standing next to the victim. His device then passes that challenge on to the key fob, which then responds back with the proper code and sends it back to the person by the vehicle itself, it's like a, it gets on the car and drives off with your ride. It's like a two-way man in the middle. Yeah, there. You know, it's, a it's, two it's a two relay. person, a, a two person. Sorry, or two device. Well, I guess you'd need people to, in this case to hold the device. Theoretically, right. well, not not necessarily. The one that's near the key fob, conceivably, could just be sitting there, like relaying, right? Could be. Uh, you know, the, the key thing here, of course, is the guy who's getting ready to steal the car has to be in, buy the correct car. Right. Well, I, I mean, to, yes, and to steal a car, obviously, you have to, well, not necessarily. I guess you could hack into a remotely and remotely drive it. We've talked about that in, in the past. Yeah. But, yeah, this is, it's interesting that uh, there are uh, two devices that are required. Uh, so it's like a two-device man in the middle attack. And essentially, it's just a replay uh, attack, which would like require some coordination obviously right it's not like right. an rfid attack where i can just scan your badge and then at my own leisure use that to uh enter the building right to, to replay it yeah, yeah you have a little bit of challenge and response going on here between the key fob and the car okay that's uh, even they, less concerning than i thought it was before as in but they, i was um i was actually speaking with josh corman about this issue uh who hadn't reviewed the article and, and i had just briefly read it when I was speaking with Josh yesterday and we kind of both agreed like it's not a huge deal in terms of some of the efforts we're trying to make in vehicle security because it doesn't well it doesn't affect directly the safety of people right the public safety it's not a public safety right. issue it's just a theft issue however 
I, what I said to Josh was, I'm like, I bet you if you did a study that looked at after vehicles were stolen, what is the probability that there would be an accident and physical harm? Probably quite high, although I still don't think that's enough of a driver to like make everyone panic uh, about this. We shouldn't panic, yeah, I, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, as far as f safety to people, I would assume the safety <laughs> level of the the car thief driving is going to be about the same as any car thief driving, right? Correct. Um, one of the things that yeah, they showed in their video, they actually have a video on the Hack in the Box website mm -hmm. um, kind of showing how this would work. Two guys are sitting outside of a coffee shop, right? Somebody pulls up you know, the car that they wanted, uh, walks in, one attacker walks in behind that guy, and the other guy goes out to the car. So the coordination can be really pretty quick. Yep. Um, it took just a few moments. The key things that they did here is, one, the hardware that had been used and software that had been used in this previously had gotten pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. Originally, they were talking about a couple of thousand dollars. Then somebody got it down to a couple hundred bucks. Now you've got two $11 devices mm -hmm. that are really pretty small. You know, they, they would look a little odd, but it wouldn't be a big deal to have it in a sweatshirt pocket or something like that. When I first went to the article and saw the picture, I thought it was a cell phone jammer. Yeah, it, I, I, it, I mean, it looked to me in, in size and stuff like mm -hmm. that, like a, a Pony Express device in mm -hmm. some way. So, I mean, it just wasn't very big. And um, the other thing that they did that was interesting with this is because they they actually spent some time reverse engineering some of the, the, uh, the protocol that was being spoken mm -hmm. by these cars. So what they were able to do was... Uh, not only intercept the signal, but slow it way down so they could, to a low, lower frequency, they could oh. transmit this much further. Right. Now, and then replay it back at the speed that the car expects. And so, you know, isn't just a simple relay. It's a, a relay, but I understand it. So I'm going to now translate this into something that I can broadcast over a further distance. That's really cool, actually. And then take off. Mm. They actually make the comment on their, their hack in the box uh summary of their talk. They're looking at how to do this over the internet. Uh, one of the problems that they have, I guess, in the security of the cars is there's no timing awareness in the vehicles. You know, it sends out the signal, waits for the response. When it gets it, it gets it and it acts on it. So you can have a bear, fair bit of delay here. Mm -hmm. um, so really pretty interesting. Um, I I uh, it caught my eye, quite honestly, because I've been looking at cars lately, mm -hmm. and I was noticing how much is being put into the electronics in our, our vehicles now and control over things like, you know, the suspension setup of your ride and, and all kinds of stuff. And then here's these key fobs where, you know, somebody walks in with a fairly small handheld device and your car just drove off and you're – a thousand or more feet away from it. You didn't even see, you, know, you had no chance of seeing this. And this is just for uh, wireless uh, key fobs that work based on proximity, right? It's not the key fobs that you have to, in older cars, like push the button. Right. And they, the, uh, they talk about it. The, um, the chips are built by a company named NXP. It's a PKE equipped vehicles is what this affects. Okay. Uh, passive keyless entry is yep. what they call it. So uh, go check out the slides. They've got it on their hack in the, on the hack in the box uh, uh, summary uh, of the the talk, as well as links to uh, manufacturer specifications to get some more understanding about how it works. Uh, I thought it was pretty pretty snazzy little hack, and uh, you know definitely kind of opened my eyes to how how well some of the security around these key fobs works. Fantastic, Jason Wood. Thank you very much for contributing to this episode of Hack Naked News. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. We'll see everyone next time.